we're seeing more and more and more people with atrial fibrillation. It's a common comorbid condition in lots of people that we see. You know, I, you know, I, I did a I did a clinic, a uh, visiting clinic up in Tolaga uh, about six weeks ago, and the vast majority of people I saw had atrial fibrillation as something else going on among all their other conditions. So we, we see it a lot. It is now the commonest reason, the commonest cardiac reason for hospital, hospitalization in New Zealand. So it's taken over acute coronary syndromes and heart failure. So it's, it's a big ticket item on all our day-to-day -day, uh, activities in medicine and cardiology. So what, what I'd like to do is, so the outline of this, this, this presentation is around improving detection, uh, protection, and perfection of care. Now, I, I didn't think of these. I'd like to think I did think of them, but I didn't. But this, this is, I've, I've plagiarized this from the London AF improvement cycle. We are, a, the Heart Foundation is about to do an AF awareness campaign to align with World AF Awareness Week. There's lots of activities around the year with atrial fibrillation. Our pillars are uh, around awareness, detection, and management, and we've taken them from this London improvement cycle in the London region in England. So why it's important, it is the most common arrhythmia that most of us see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's independently associated with increased long-term risk of stroke. We've known about stroke for a long time. I think we've not recognized the association with other mortality from atrial fibrillation and morbidity as much as we should, but we know it causes heart failure, increases mortality, and it leads to impaired quality of life and a lot of people who have atrial fibrillation. We know uh, more than ever we can mitigate the risk of stroke with the novel treatments we have available to us to reduce, you know, thrombotic events. But all-cause mortality and other deaths and complications such as heart failure remain, remain high, and we need to continue to work with that. Um, we'll just use some cases to illustrate some of the, the issues around this as, we just, as the talk evolves. We mentioned also the fact that it's common to have atrial fibrillation in people with coronary artery disease. So 10 to 30% of people with atrial fibrillation admitted to hospital each year for cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular causes. The prevalence is around 2 to 4%. We know it becomes much more frequent as we age, but we probably underestimate the true prevalence because a lot of people that you and I will see, particularly you will see with atrial fibrillation for the first time, is it's an incidental finding. Someone who's elderly goes in to get their blood pressure checked, their pulse is noted to be irregular, and ECG confirms atrial fibrillation. Data we have in New Zealand, we've got two studies in New Zealand, uh, one from Murray Tilliard's group, uh, a retrospective cohort study uh, using primary care records, prevalence just under 2%, higher in Māori and Pacific. Data from Rob Doughty and other investigators in Auckland would suggest similar prevalence, slightly higher in Māori and Pacific, maybe 2 to 4% in Māori and Pacific. So if we talk about detection, public awareness, I think what I want to talk about a little bit is public awareness, the benefits of pulse checks, and the use of novel technology. So the rationale is that we know that previously unknown, we know about known AF and the association with strokes, but we also have evidence linking unknown AF with ischemic strokes. The evidence suggests that up to just under two percent of patients in community practices above 65 will have unknown asymptomatic AF on screening. Screening in an at-risk population over a two-week period using handheld devices, uh, find 3% of that population had atrial fibrillation. And most of the people identified, I mean, this population here by virtue of age alone, 
Charles II VAR score of 2, we are going to be recommending commencing an antithrombotic agent. So they're likely to benefit if we pick up atrial fibrillation. So again, from Rob's work, should we screen earlier in Māori and Pacific? This data to me suggests that we probably should. It's suggesting that Māori and Pacific, again, present on average 10 years, they picked it up 10 years earlier than Pākehā, than Māori and Pacific, in Māori and Pacific, and suggests that maybe, maybe we should look at screening below the age of 65 in Māori and Pacific. Thoughts on that? Sound reasonable? Yeah, I was just going to, I'll show them my little device. I've got a little device here that you, it, it's a little metal bar and you put your fingers on it like that and it comes through to my phone. It takes 60 seconds to do a, it's called a live call. A live call? About $200 for the pad. The, the app's free, of course, but it's not much use without the phone. And then, uh, record somebody's whether they've got AF or not. So it um, saves people the 40 bucks we charge for an ECG and it's much quicker to do. So, you oh, there it is, there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As you were. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but yeah. So you, you were saying earlier you find this quite, quite useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I cross check it. If I've got somebody with AF, I check it and it's come out all right yeah. uh, every time, basically. Yeah. So I've got a fair. They used it in a study up in Wellsford with Tim uh, Malloy, did it up in their practice. Yeah, yeah. So, so part of, the, part of our, our campaign with the Heart Foundation is, is trying to um, educate people about the importance of checking their own pulse. Good thing, bad thing? I think it's a good thing. Um, I, I, I think our, our comms people love angles, so this, this initially had all sorts of things on it around lifelines, pulse, you know, and it's, it's a little bit corny. But, but, but it's... And also, you'd be pleased. So, what they want to do initially, if your pulse was below 50 or your so pulse below 50 or above 100 or a regular CUGP, I thought mm, primary care may not be too impressed with sending everybody whose pulse is below 50 to see. Yeah, there's a lot of people with pulses below 50. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a few. There's a few. Yeah. 60 it was actually, Bruce. Oh, 60. 60, yeah. Okay. Um, but but what, 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 what we've actually going to say, if your pulse is a regular, Normal pulse for most people is between 50 and that, 50 and 100. Say, if it's if it's irregular, please see your health professional for a check. What we're also going to do in high-risk communities, uh, so Māori and Pacific, we've identified some areas. Tarafiti is one, yeah. strange, but Tarafiti is one. <laughs> so, uh, uh, counties Manukau is another area. We're going to be um, using doing some screening with a live core, but also. If someone's got a pulse, an irregular pulse, we're going to be saying, and they're identified through some of the screening checks that our teams are doing, we're going to be paying for an ECG. So, and the ministry provided money to allow that to happen. So, yeah. So that's. So again, it's around awareness to the public, to actually improve detection, and there'll be some other information going out to health professionals. Around, firstly, informing the campaigns ha happening and also around the importance of what we're talking about today. And lots of presentations, including Andrew's webinar next week, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Next Tuesday, yep. Sign up. So we know about undiagnosed AF. We talked about undiagnosed AF and stroke. And it's always a concern to all of us when a young person specifically comes in, or an older person comes in with a stroke, we don't really know what the cause of the stroke is. They've got carotid ultrasounds done. We haven't shown anything. We're, we're not, we don't really know what's going on. Their blood pressure is not particularly elevated. CT doesn't show anything specific. How hard do we look for atrial fibrillation? And there is data to say that if you do a lot of screening, you'll pick up more and more atrial fibrillation. The longer you screen, the more likely you are to pick it up. But how long is a piece of string? And that's the, that's the complex bit of all of this. But what we do know in cryptogenic stroke, the longer you screen, the more likely you are to pick up. And we use these devices occasionally. We don't use them a lot for atrial fibrillation screening in stroke. Um, the neurologists would like us to use them a lot, a lot more. But again, the, this is expensive technology still. Mm -hmm. 
But I What's think the dif difference between, uh, how, how common is like ASD versus if I've got a patient who had a DVT and then he's had two strokes um, from you know, going from the right to the left side compared to AF? Is there, this AF would be much more, uh, un undetective a AF would be more common, I presume. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Much, more, much more common. He just had a bubble echo. So he had a PFO like, or, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, much more common. Hmm. But young, young strokes, so, so again, it's, it's an important question as well, just to di digress, digress a little bit further. It's the investigation of cryptogenic stroke, and I think it's directed by patient age specifically. Um, I don't know what a PFO means in a 70 year old man who's had a stroke. That's highly unlikely to be the cause of that 70-year-old man's stroke, but a PFO in a 40-year-old person where there's no other cause for that stroke is likely to be involved. Mm. So you make a, a much stronger argument for closure of that PFO yeah. in that younger person. He was about 55 when he got it. Yeah. So. Yep. And they yep. found, they found yep. they couldn't find it the first time. They yep. found it after the second. Well, yep. he was actually anticoagulated, so fortunately. Yeah, yeah Deb. How long do you need to act Yeah, it's a, so it's a really good question and nobody knows the answer to that. Uh, so how much atrial fibrillation, uh, I'll, I'll change the question around slightly. How much atrial fibrillation on a Holter monitor is important? We don't, we don't know and there's trials going on to look at that. But I think if you've seen a 2% 1 to 2% burden of atrial fibrillation, that's important in someone particularly who's had a stroke. I don't make I, I don't take much, I pay much attention to, you know, 30, 40, 50 beats of an irregular narrow complex rhythm when I'm reporting a halter from the point of view of risk for stroke. I haven't answered your question, but it's, it's a difficult question. Five hours? Yeah, I, I know there's trials going on at the moment, which will hopefully report in the next, try to answer that question, how much AF is enough AF? Of course, we're starting to see other things coming out now around high atrial ectopic burden potentially been associated with increased risk of stroke as well. That probably makes some sense if you look at the, the succession of stuff. You know, if you've got a, lots of atrial ectopics and you would have a, let's say it was AF and you had a child's two vast score of five, Potentially, you may be at risk, but we 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 don't know. We don't know. So we mentioned the Alive Core. Um, lots of interest in novel technology. Apple's involved in the assessment of novel technology, and this is one of the trials that reported earlier this year at the American Heart Meeting, where they looked at um, the ability of the Apple Watch to try to pick up undiagnosed arrhythmias was, and tried to confirm that with further investigations to confirm what it was actually saying or calling was actually correct. For the vast majority of people, so they screened a lot of people here, uh, just, uh, just over 400,000 people, 99.5% there were no notifications. I'm not sure if they all got free Apple watches, that would be a good trial to be involved with. Yeah. But there was pulse notification in 0.5, just over 2,000 people. An ECG patch was returned and analyzed in a third of these patients. And there was um, a reasonable correlation in people that had the ECG patch. So positive predictive value of just, you know, 70%. So it's, it's getting there, it's not there yet, but I think we're going to see wearables we're already seeing it, you know, we're all seeing patients coming in and saying, my heart rate's up, doc, what does it mean? We're going to see these wearables been able to identify rhythms such as atrial fibrillation. So I think 34% had atrial fibrillation on the patch with suspected AF. So I think it's, it's early days, but this, this is promising technology and it isn't going to go away. I think this is an interesting study and this is looking at AI. Um, in people who may have had AF, who have AF, and who have had AF diagnosed at some stage, the algorithm can look at an ECG that picks up signals that it believes is consistent with the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation that you and I cannot interpret on an ECG. 
So we're going to see all of this technology moving forward very fast to enable us to improve our diagnostic uptake of AF. The problem I have with this, what does it mean? Does this mean I'm at increased risk of stroke if I've got an, e an AI algorithm predicting I've got AF and I've got no documented AF? I don't know. But it's, it's going to challenge us, isn't it? So again, let's not forget the other things we've got to do in someone who we see with atrial fibrillation. So this is around management of risk factors and concomitant disease. So high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, valvular disease, identify and manage weight. We all know there's an association between Excess, excess weight and symptom burden with atrial fibrillation. We all know that there's really good data come out from the unit in Adelaide, led by Price Sanders, who's taught a number of people in this country uh, electrophysiology, that if you lose weight and you've got a lot of AF, your symptom burden decreases dramatically, so much so that people come off waiting less for ablation. Uh, so it's a really important part of management of atrial fibrillation. So sleep apnea comes up again. And I remember um, one of the first patients that I was involved, whose care I was involved with when I came back to New Zealand, having been in, um, doing the sleep year in, in Australia, we saw someone that had lots of tachy and bradyarrhythmias with AF, a big person who we, who we diagnosed sleep apnea, got established on nasal CPAP, and his arrhythmia has actually settled down just by effective treatment of his sleep apnea, particularly his bradyarrhythmias. So here's a case, a 59-year-old man with an irregular pulse. So he's had no symptoms. And this is someone from up the coast I saw um, a couple of months ago. So hypertension, type 2 diabetes. There are the medications he's on. So what now? So we need some basic investigations, don't we? So even someone who's AF and no symptoms, I believe it's very important we assess what his or her rate control actually is. Because we, we see it time and time again, someone admitted with severe left ventricular dysfunction, and the cause of that is poorly controlled atrial fibrillation, and it's been that way for a wee while. I think an echo is important. An echo is important not to, tell, not to inform us about what the risk of stroke is, but whether there's other things going on. What's the left ventricular function is like? It may augment our risk assessment for child's too vast, but it is, it is not one of the variables we, we use in most people. Um, child's too vast. And of course, thyroid function tests. Let's not forget them. We do forget them at times. So again, <clears throat> anybody I see with atrial fibrillation, and this is, the, this is how I look at management and how I prioritize management. The first is stroke, and then the second is symptoms, and what do I need to do about the symptoms? So first, stroke prevention. We all use Charles Duvast, don't we? Anybody not use it? Everybody got it up here now? So his Charles Duvast score is two. So what are we going to do? Should he be on an antithrombotic agent? What would you put him on, Joe? You wouldn't, get, you wouldn't even think about warfarin? Not anymore? Great, I agree. Anybody use warfarin still to reduce thrombotic risk in atrial fibrillation? You still use it? Yeah, there'll still be people on it, won't there? Yeah. So we, we know that lots of evidence to say if your child's two vast score is two or greater, the benefit outweighs the risk of being on an antithrombotic agent, particularly with the direct oral anti anticoagulant agents that we've got available today. 
I think this is an important statement as well, and I think we're going to see a lot more in this space around Charles Tuvas score one, not based on sex alone. Why I say that is that we're seeing publications coming out now around the association between AF and dementia. And what we see here is a gradated increase in the incidence of dementia in patients who are stroke free with atrial fibrillation related to the chance to VASC. What we also see is that oral anticoagulant use decreases the likelihood of developing dementia <coughs> or Alzheimer's disease in patients with atrial fibrillation and also with a Charles Tuvas score of one or above. Okay, so the only people that do not benefit from an antithrombotic agent with atrial fibrillation to reduce the likelihood of dementia in these studies is people with a Charles Tuvas score of zero. Okay, they're not randomized data, it's intriguing data, and it's suggesting, okay, you've got someone that you're, you know, Charles Tuvas score of one or not, do I look at an antithrombotic agent? I'd probably say there's more evidence to say for a lot of people, we're more likely to be doing good than harm. So emerging evidence. Registry data from Sweden, a lot of patients in the registry data. Comments? Any, you have many people with Charles Tuvas score of one that you have on an antithrombotic agent? If you had AF and you had a Charles Tuvas score of one, <laughs> I'd be on it. <laughs> I think I would as well. I think yeah. I would as well. Particularly now we've got direct acting oral anticoagulants. Um, particularly now we've got a once a day agent as well. So we've got opportunities to protect. So detection, protection. So manage our patients appropriately. Let's not forget about the other cardiovascular risk factors. We know it's a, it, AF is one of, the, you know, one of the factors in cardiovascular risk. Let's not forget about blood pressure and cholesterol. Anybody believe that aspirin, clopidogrel, has a role to play in reducing thromboembolic risk? Anybody still use it? It's late in the day, no one's admitting anything. <laughs> Doesn't work. It doesn't work. The, 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 any of the trial data, registry data we have says it does not reduce thromboembolic risk. It increases bleeding risk. So aspirin is, you know, it, I think it's a, a drug whose era has been, and it's probably becoming less and less useful. And I think we're going to probably see it much more restricted in the next five years. Who even in acute coronary centres, I, I would predict. You know, interested in it for the bowel cancer thing. Possibly. Bring you back to Jerry's point. <laughs> no, but, but, but it's interesting. So when, when we first started using Ticargalore, uh, and I'm sure other people would have the same experience, we had a number of people that had GI bleeds on Ticargalore, and ball bleeds specifically. And it was because it unmasked rectal neoplasms. So I think there is something in it in that regard that it just unmasks stuff that's already there. Uh, good. So again, if we look at the choice of agents in 2019, I think the use of warfarin should be restricted by and large for people with moderate to severe mitral stenosis or prosthetic heart valve. The, the, the data that we have around using NOAX or DOAX in patients with prosthetic heart valves is limited and suggests that it, they do not work. They actually increase the risk of there's increased um, thromboembolic events in people with prosthetic heart valves. So the trials have really been stopped in that, in that, in that arena at the moment. Does it matter whether it's paroxysmal or persistent? The answer is it doesn't. If someone's got PAF and they've got a Charles Tuvas score of two or higher, then the risk benefit assessment of antithrombotic agent 
needs, needs to be made, whether, and you know, your decision should be made on that, not the fact that the AF's paroxysmal or persistent. What about atrial flutter? Joe? Yeah, so atrial flutter is the same. So we don't talk about atrial flutter when we talk about atrial fibrillation, but atrial flutter is the same. So the risk, we apply the same CHAS2 VAS score to patients with atrial flutter, and they, would, they should be considered for an antithrombotic agent dependent on what their CHAS2 VAS score is. And again, we all do this, I hope, particularly assessing the renal function. I'll let you read that for a second. And I'll let you ask questions about that one. Some of them sound familiar. <coughs> we talked about this one this morning, didn't we? Aspirin should always be continued with anticoagulants. The patient has CVD. We know that's, that's not a good thing in the long term and someone does not have symptoms from his or her cardiovascular disease. My patient is renally impaired, so they cannot use an oral anti anticoagulant. That's not right. Must stop anticoagulant. That's not right. Any comments? Any questions? Which? I. I'm not certain we, we can say that specifically. I mean, we, we've got two DOACs available in New Zealand, haven't we? And I, I think my practice has evolved um, from being used to having Pradaxa available and now having the choice of Rivaroxaban. I use more Rivaroxaban specifically for people that want once a day preparations. I mean, the data that we have for Rivaroxaban suggests it's as good as warfarin, not superior, whereas high dose Pradax is actually superior to warfarin. So, again, if, you, if you're try, you know, going to give your patient the best bang for the buck, then Pradaxa probably is a better choice if you're going to use the 150 BD regime as opposed to the 110 BD. The other point that Joe made earlier, we do have a reversal agent for Pradaxa available currently. So again, if you've got someone at increased bleeding risk, you may want to use that. Um, I think Reva, we will have one probably within the next sort of 24 months. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. So did you hear that? Ed? So it's around compliance and blister packs, and that that is an important thing, isn't it? Because you know we we. You know, people bring in their blister packs and then they bring in the, open the Pradaxa. <laughs> uh, but you can put Reva in the uh, blister packs and that really is an, an important. Bruce, your you thoughts on which one is best or which one you use? Um, give patients the choice. Um, it depends how much they want the uh, antidote, really. You know, if they're gun shy about uh, not being able to reverse it, I think is yeah. a bit of a deal, uh, deal breaker. Yeah. But, uh, if I had a choice, I'd take uh, that over warfarin, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but isn't it you know, refreshing? We're not talking about warfarin anymore. Oh, yeah. You know, we're, we're talking about a two different direct oral anticoagulants instead of warfarin. Well, you always call warfarin the drug that'll get you on the front page of the New Zealand Herald, as it did one of my classmates. Gave a loading dose, and the patient kept, kept giving the loading a dose and on an orthopedic ward. And oh. Went over two weeks later, and he disappeared for about 20 years finally emerged back. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've not seen any, any contemporary data about the use of antithrombotic agents in atrial fibrillation in New Zealand. It is something that we need to do. We talked about some of the stuff BNP earlier, or heart failure and echo. We need to understand where we are with anticoagulating high-risk patients in New Zealand. I would predict, since we've got these agents available, we are much better than we were historically, which was probably around 
60%, 50-60%. Um, Child's Duval score of 2 on warfarin previously. So I think we'll, we'll be better with these new agents. But, but I think it is something that we need, we need to do. And again, it was some work we were thinking of doing in the Midland region. Um, I thought I'd just mention this as well. This is, this is controversial. It's been, go sorry, Pharmac, it's been going through a, uh, a, a stop, start, stop, 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 start, stop process with, with Pharmac, with various subcommittees, and I don't know where it is currently. The data that we have around percutaneous left atrial appendage, so putting a little device in the, the appendage of the left atrium, why there? That's where all the clot forms when you've got the stasis because of the AF. If someone's in, it, if someone's in AF, the atria are going up, about up to 600 beats per minute. So you get stasis in the, in the atrium, in the collecting chambers, particularly this little bit there. We've got a number of trials that suggest that this reduces the likelihood of stroke in high-risk patients with atrial fibrillation. And particularly in people who are at increased risk of bleeding. And that's our recommendation to Pharmac, the Cardiac Society and the Cardiac Network, is that we should be considering the use of these, these devices in people who are at increased risk of stroke who cannot take, for lots of good reasons, an antithrombotic agent. Um, some of the arguments is the trials were done historically with warfarin, the bleeding. So do we need to do these trials again with the DOAX and the NOAX? I don't think so. I think we've got to accept that if someone's got an increased bleeding risk, or they've had a bleeding event, and they're at high risk of stroke, then it, this is something that we should be considering as, a, as an alternative option. Available privately, not currently available publicly, but being done publicly in a number of the hospitals using um, backdoor. Not backdoor, it's usually it's a, it's a part of a trial actually currently. So just to summarize stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation, mechanical valves or moderate severe mitral stenosis. If that's present, patients should be on warfarin to reduce the thromboembolic risk. If it's not, child's too vast score of zero, then they do not need to be on an antithrombotic or an antiplatelet agent. Child's too vast score of one, consider an oral antithrombotic. Greater than two, an oral anticoagulant is recommended. And if you've got increased bleeding risk, then consider a left atrial appendage occlusion device. So the, le the left atrial appendage, so how, how would you decide someone needed that sort of a, that, that procedure? What would be the clinical? So, so, our, so the recommendations with discussions with pharma, and there is some going on around the country. Uh, there's, there's trials going on currently around the country still from overseas that, that New Zealand sites are involved with. Um, it is, you've either had a bleed on an oral anticoagulant or you're deemed, the risk of being on one is deemed prohibitive because of your perceived bleeding risk. Usually the, the former, uh, that you've already had a bleed on warfarin or a direct oral anticoagulant and you've got a high chance to vas score. What, is, what does high mean? Uh, I think we've suggested three or above. So yeah. So I, I think in fairness to Pharmac, Pharmac have picked this up through one of the previous committees. I don't, P, I don't know what it was. It was one of the ones that Ann Colby chaired. I don't know what they were called previously. And it just sat on the fence for a wee while with nobody been able to make decisions. Pharmac actually have recommended that this device is used uh, with those criteria that we've suggested. The problem is nobody's prepared at the ministry level to actually work out how it's funded. So it's just sitting there. I think ADHB are looking at implementing as part of the process based on those recommendations from Pharmac. Um, anticoagulant care. This is, this is, you know, these are important. We need to educate people why they take the medications, not just antithrombotic agents, but all medications, but specific to this, the benefits of them, uh, potential interactions. Support for patients, support for people uh, involved in care. Education is important. We all need to know when, when not to, uh, when to stop. Uh, you know the use of agents. I think this is probably becoming 
less of an issue for us when we're using less warfarin, but we will still use warfarin for specific indications, such as mechanical heart valves, and review the services. So this is, this is looking at your own service, how you can perfect your service in the management of your patients and the care of your patients with atrial fibrillation. So I think it is important that um, we do critique our own services on a regular basis. Know your drugs. We've only got, we're lucky we've only got two available to us. We should be familiar with these and know the doses, know the indications for dose reduction. So familiarize yourself with the agents that you use and uh, why we do things differently at certain levels of creatinine specifically. Two things I think of, stroke risk, what's the risk of stroke, what to do with symptoms. A lot of people may be asymptomatic, that's easy to a degree, but I would still do a whole to monitor in those patients to assess rate control of atrial fibrillation, even in the absence of symptoms. Okay? But then what do we do about symptom management? So again, if we look at, so we've got two options, it's either rate control or rhythm control. What we mean by rhythm control is re-establishing sinus rhythm and trying to maintain sinus rhythm. The guidelines would say for the vast majority of people who you or I see in atrial fibrillation, we should offer rate control as the first line strategy. So that means ensuring that AF is well rate controlled. If it's got a reversible cause, such as thyrotoxicosis or post-op cardiac surgery, probably post-op cardiac surgery is the one that we tend to see most frequently, then you, you will try to get the people, patients back to sinus rhythm. Post-op cardiac surgery, the vast majority of them will revert to sinus rhythm, but some will require a cardioversion to get them back to sinus rhythm. We've got an emerging, emerging evidence base around the use around um, rhythm control, so re-establishing sinus rhythm in people with heart failure, where AF is thought to be the cause, but also a bedfellow. So it is actually a driver. It may not be the cause, but it's there, and it's actually making things worse. Atrial flutter. EP docs love this. It's easy for them to fix, okay? So atrial flutter, we should be referring for rhythm control, so re-establishing sinus rhythm. So this is what our guidelines say, and this effectively is what, what I, I t how I tend to practice when I see someone for rate control. So AF, we're not happy that the ventricular rate is well controlled. Let's say we've done a halter monitor and we see that it's not well controlled or we get someone to walk from the chair to the, to the examination bed and their heart rate shoots up, that's not well controlled. If you know they've got left ventricular systolic dysfunction or not, that's, that's helpful. If you know they've got it, then a beta blocker is the first line agent. A beta blocker if you don't know or they don't have it, it should be your first line agent also for rate control. Where this is different is that we are not keen on the use of diltiazem. And diltiazem is the only non dihydropyridine calcium antagonist we, we would use here because verapamil and a beta blocker, the incidence of AV block is unacceptably high, so we would not use that in combination. But we are not keen on it over here where heart, where there's left ventricular systolic dysfunction because we know it's not a good thing to give them where someone's got a reduced ejection fraction. So we optimize the dose of this and still not good rate control and I would assess that usually with a Holter monitor, we would add digoxin, okay? If that's still not effective, then I think we would then look at what can we do next? And often we will look at AV node ablation. So blocking the, so AF can no longer get through if you do an AV node ablation, but you've got to put a pacemaker in there, okay? Amiodarone is also an option. It's a drug that in New Zealand, I don't think we use a lot of, certainly I don't use a lot of it. I think it's a horrible drug. I think it's a noxious drug, but it has a role to play 
on occasions. So over here, where LV function is normal, we can add, we've got the extra step of being able to add cardism in, adultism in. So again, you're, you've got the option of triple therapy here, which is a beta blocker, adultism, and digoxin. If that's still not working, then you can consider these other options here. Okay? Rhythm control. So what do we do to try to reestablish rhythm control? I think the first thing, the first really important question is, does the patient have structural heart disease? What does that mean? That means LV systolic dysfunction, left ventricular hypertrophy, I would regard, and the guidelines regard as structural heart disease or established coronary artery disease. If they have, sorry, let's go down if they have not. If they have not, then flecainide is, is not an unreasonable first choice agent, so it's a class one agent, got minimal side effects, and it works for a lot of people. What we need to do though with flecainide is flecainide will not block AV node transmission. So if someone goes into fast AF and they've got, and they're on flecainide, it will be rapid AF still, unless you've got something in the background to slow the AF when they go into it. So that could be diltiazem or it could be a simple beta blocker. Okay, so something to think about when you've got someone on flecainide. I've got a young doctor over in Terafity uh, who gets a lot, a bit of AF when he's out. He's an endurance athlete, and we are just we're looking. He's got a resting bradycardia, so we've agreed just to use flecainide on its own without something for rate control. Um, I. I don't believe this is a step that we look at at all in New Zealand for the vast majority of people that we see with atrial fibrillation. So if someone feels fleconide and then we look at sotalol or, fle or the other way around, fleconide or sotalol or sotalol or fleconide, so two class one agents, we've got two options here to look at. If someone's still getting breakthrough symptoms that are intrusive on their day-to-day -day activities, the guidelines Cardiac Society guidelines would say, well, maybe think about amiodarone. I don't believe we, we do that, and I don't think we should do that, but it is an option. We would tend to go to considering catheter ablation here, okay, referring for an AF ablation. On this side, where someone's got structural heart disease, again, most of us would not use amiodarone. We would look at Sotolo, occasionally a simple beta blocker. And then we would, if the patients fail that, we would consider a catheter ablation. We talked about weight loss. It's really important in reducing symptom burden, okay? So we forget about this. We should be encouraging our patients uh, with lifestyle intervention. So a couple of cases to finish, because I'm almost finished. <laughs> A six month a six a sixty four year old man with a six month history of effort intolerance. He's had AF for a wee while. Background of hypertension and diabetes, chance to vascular of two, I think. I did that quickly. I think it's two. But he's at increased thrombotic risk, isn't he? So examination, blood pressure, AF one ten beats per minute, no evidence of heart failure. What are you going to do? So he's breathless. He's got AF. Doesn't look particularly well rate controlled. There you go. So he's on a diuretic. High dose Pradaxa, Bisoprolol, Digoxin, Dultiazem. What are you going to do? Holter? Okay, we might do a Holter. I'll give you some investigation. So it's not already peptides up a little bit. Holter shows poor rate control, no significant pauses. TFTs are normal. Echo, got severe L left atrial dilatation, not an uncommon feature in echo when someone that's had AF for a wee while. 
not a favorable feature for our electrophysiology colleagues. They don't like a big left atrium. The predictor of long-term success with ablation is less. What now? He's on a bit of Dage, I think, isn't he, Dave? So uh, I think our management really, we have an, ex I think it's, remember ischemia, remember we talked about AF and ischemic heart disease, common bedfellows, I think it's important to exclude ischemia and someone like this, ongoing symptoms of breathlessness predominantly, it's natriuretic peptides up a little bit, um, but also we should be optimizing rate control. Okay, so again, if we look here, that's what our guideline says. He's got, for his, his LV function is normal. We would actually maximize the dose of his beta blockers on, on five of his operal and increase it to 10. You could increase the dose of diltiazem further to 360. He's on DIG um, 0.25. And then you could look at what's going on after that. And I would look at that, not that, in someone, in a patient like this but I try to push really hard with medical therapy here, okay? So 76-year-old man, similar risk factor, age, previous MI, chance to vascular five. He's on these medications. So he's on a good dose of bisoprolol, He's on a reasonable dose of DIG. He's on a maximal dose of Dultaizen. So what now? So there's nitric peptides up. Don't know why I keep doing that, but I do. There's LV, severe LA dilatation. Segmental dysfunction, this is previous MI, project ejection fraction. We did a stress echo because of his previous history as well of MI, no evidence of ischemia. Poor rate control with no significant pauses. Optimized rate control, yeah? So he doesn't have severe LV systolic dysfunction. He's on good doses of that, that, he's on DIG. We should be looking at either this, which I'm not a fan of, or referring for AV node ablation and permanent pacemaker implantation. Yeah? I don't think he's a good candidate <coughs> for um, AF ablation because of his severe LA dilatation. The guys would, would actually go ahead and do his AV node and put a pacemaker in if we referred someone like this to them, okay? Rather than aiming for a rhythm control strategy. Yeah? So again, 67-year-old lady, had AF for a wee while, field flecainide, hypertension, Charles II score 3, examination in sinus rhythm when we see her, currently on Sotolol, 80 milligrams BD, rivaroxaban and Salazapril. Holter unremarkable. Moderate left atrial dilatation. What now? Ablation? Everybody agree ablation? Yeah. So she's failed. She's failed too. Does this concern you? Probably not. We just happen to have picked her on a good day, haven't we? I think she knows her symptoms and she's getting breakthrough atrial fibrillation, she's failed flecainide, she's failed sotolol. So she is someone that we should be considering for an ablation. Okay? And that's failed those two agents. We would not go there. We would refer, certainly we would not go there in a 64-year-old lady. We would refer for a catheter ablation. Okay? So that's someone, again, failed two class one agents with paroxysmal AF, we want to try and maintain sinus rhythm, someone we would consider in the New Zealand environment for an ablation, not amiodarone. Okay, so that's someone we want to see for consideration of an ablation. Last case, I think. 46-year-old um, man, dilated cardiomyopathy, he's had AF for a wee while. 
AF110 medications currently. Nitritic peptide still high. Severe LV systolic dysfunction, four chambers up, left atrium's moderately dilated. What not? So remember I mentioned we, we've got data and emerging evidence base around the benefits of ablation in people with heart failure reduced ejection fraction. Um, so that's regardless of whether a, we're, you know, this is people that may have established AF for a wee while. Restoring sinus rhythm is an important part of patient's care and it reduces further events and mortality. So this patient is someone that we would consider for an ablation and we've had some pretty good successes with people like this with improvement of LV function. So again, severe LV systolic dysfunction, I would not use amiodarone on someone like this. We would not, most of our electrophysiologists would not use amiodarone. We would go for an ablation in this patient, okay? Okay, so I think this might be the future. Uh, data coming out about integrated AF specialist clinics. We talk about the heart teams, lots of things that we do. I think we talk about integrated teams. And this is a multidisciplinary patient-centered care around lifestyle intervention, optimizing the things that we know we need to do around you know, stroke prevention, uh, medication, blood pressure. And with this approach, there was a significant reduction in events during follow-up and so cause mortality here with an AF integrated care model as opposed to usual care. And again, this is work led out of the, the group in Adelaide, so telling us that we, we probably need to start thinking pretty soon about how we do AF differently given the, the epidemic that we're actually currently facing with AF. And it's across primary, secondary care, I think, to keep people you know, out of hospital. 55% relative risk reduction. So pretty, pretty powerful. So again, just to f finish with a couple of key messages. Pulse checks are good, we believe, trying to, you know, opportunistic screening, teaching people to take their own pulses will be part of the campaign. I'd suggest that in our populations, this needs to be younger than it, than 65, in our, particularly our high-risk populations. Aspirin does not work. Please don't use it. If you've got people with AF on aspirin, please stop it and consider uh, why they're not on a DOAC. Evidence-based approach to care, stroke prophylaxis, and the use of anticoagulants uh, between prescribers and patients. So that's Bruce. I'm done. Literally. <laughs> Literally. <laughs>